when we had our eyes open and our uh, visuals aligned. I, I tend to think that maybe consciousness is an effect of the water in our bodies and that we have spent an awful lot of time thinking that it was our brains or our hearts or our stomachs that made us conscious when in reality, water is in all of those organs and we really get conscious because the water can align itself to different vectors and stimulate the imagination. Right, so um, I've got conscious, I've got, so in theory, I've got conscious water in every cell in my body. Is that what you're saying? Yes, I think that water has several different roles within the body and that the role it takes in fluidizing the bloodstream is just one of the many roles, even though biology might teach us that that's the major role. I'm not quite as uh, linked on that concept. All right, well... Uh... I did a little bit of research about four or five days ago, which means that I've forgotten most of it. But I think there's, there was some, some research by uh, a French guy called Ben Vista in the 80s or the 90s that had something to do with consciousness of water. It was more to do with homeopathy, but it's a similar kind of idea. Yes, Ben Veniste, Jean Benviste in France, did a lot of homeopathy work, and he was one of the groundbreakers. He tended to publish in the major journals, Science and Nature, but then after a bit, towards the end of the 1980s, the editors decided to withdraw his work. And another Frenchman named Marcel Schiff in the early 1990s wrote a book called The Memory of Water that went into a defense of Bienveniste's work and really developed the ideas of water being a living being and storing memory for the cells and the other organelles in the body. And so that was pretty much written off until 2010 or so when Gerald Pollack at the University of Washington came up with a book called The Fourth Phase of Water based on a prior book from the 2000s called Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life and again made the case for water being conscious. Okay, so there's a little bit of history with this, although it's... it's uh... Ben Venista seems to have been scrubbed out of scientific history for some reason, uh, coincidentally. Uh, like yeah. Royal Rife or uh, many other scientists of the last century. Yeah, well, it, it is starting to come back a little bit. I found half a dozen videos on YouTube, uh, including a documentary um, that was about an hour and a half long. So there, there is still some material there. There's still people following it up. Uh, but it's, it's, in, it's an interesting idea, and I like to play with the idea. So I'm quite happy to speculate. Uh, it seems like quite a reasonable idea to me, actually, because it, it makes sense for, for me, it makes sense for everything to be conscious. So why wouldn't water be conscious? Uh, water, I think, is conscious. And I think that... As a chemist, the reason it can be conscious is because there's at least three different degrees of freedom in the structure of the molecule. But really what it comes down to is water, when working with water, has a way of communicating with itself. So uh, if water is mixed with ions ions being charged particles like sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium, the inorganics of the body, it tends to align such that the negative side of the water, the oxygen atom, is aligned to the structure of the cation. If the ions are negative, such as, oh, a nitrate or a sulfate or even something like fluoride or chlorine, fluoride or chloride, 
then the positive side of the water molecule, the hydrogens, are oriented towards the ion, and the negative side sticks out. And so water expands the range of these ions, and the shape that water takes is a function of the size where the space is to fit in. So when you have a water environment, like in the ocean, in a lake, in a river, or even in the body, water fills up all the space that is there to occupy, and whatever is dissolved in the water is what orients the structure and sets the basis for the communications. So is it, I'm, I'm, I'm prob trying to simpl simplify this in my head because I'm not a chemist, but so that's basically one, one mineral kind of talking to another mineral via the water. Is that what you're saying? Or one, one chemical process talking to another chemical process via the water? I would say both. That the waters talk to each other and the waters also orient the chemistry of what's going on on a molecular level. I think on an atomic level, the elements that we've been given in chemistry, um, I don't know. Here, I, I'm in one of those quandaries as to what I was taught at university in science and what I've imagined the science of chemistry to be beyond what I was taught. And the work of Pollock was really seminal in making me jump ship from the ideas I had of water from my education. Pollock was a biochemist at the University of Washington, and he was never really satisfied that water was just a solvent in living systems. And so he went out on some limbs and described how water in its alignment, when it excluded everything else, would take a structured form where when water was only with water it made up a mass that would almost be like a plasma as the uh, phase but whenever there's something dissolved in the water the water functions to dissolve the 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 molecule that is within the water now, sometimes it's insoluble, which means that it doesn't dissolve in water. And so then you get things like colloids and precipitates. But most water has stuff in it and is not just pure easy water. Easy standing for exclusion zone, which was what Pollock described that fourth phase of water to be. So there's solid, which is ice, liquid, which is water, gas, which is steam, and then this easy water, which collects near the surfaces of anything that's hydrophilic. Hydro meaning water, philic meaning loving. And so you'll get a layer of water at the surface of a membrane or a biological organ. And that water communicates with the organ to accommodate it through the biological solutions. Right. Okay. So uh, I did see something about uh, about um, exclusion zones on one of these videos, and I didn't quite get it. But you're talking about maybe the is that the like the the layer of tension on the surface of the water? Is that what you're talking about, or the layer underneath the, the surface layer? It would, be, it would be coming off the surface, but it's one in which the water has included all, excluded all the ions and other things that might be dissolved. And so it's just water in resonance with water. And so what you can imagine for those modes of freedom of water that I talked about you're looking at an H2O where you've got a central oxygen working with two hydrogens bonded to it. And that means that there's two sets of unpaired electrons also that come from the oxygen. So it makes a tetrahedral, but the tetrahedral is skewed 
because the two bonded pairs, the oxygen-hydrogen bonds, those are each two electrons, and they take up more space than the non-bonded ones. And so water has a bond angle of 109.4 when it's just left alone, but it's continually in vibration and resonance, and that 109.4 is an average. But whenever it's bonded to an ion or an organ or um, proteins, enzymes, other different types of uh, biomolecules, the shape that it takes is not that ideal tetrahedral shape. And I think that each individual water molecule remembers the shapes that it had in previous environments so that it wants to go back into the environment that caused its original shape so that a water molecule that finds itself in a human after it's excluded from the human and goes back into the water system is going to be in search of another human to go back into the resonance that it originally was found in. Right. Okay, that makes sense. So that would that would if if if, if we're assuming water has some kind of consciousness or memory, and it's searching for another place where it's say it's just acquired a thought in my body, and then then somehow it it, it goes through the system and and gets into somebody else's body, would they potentially have access to that thought? Um, or is it not that kind of detail? It's, it's more kind of a general tendency towards rather than an actual thought. I, that's a good question. I don't know if the individual water molecules are capable of their own thoughts or if it takes a cluster of molecules to transmit the thoughts that come from organs like the brain or the heart. Right. Okay, so here's another question for you, because I'm thinking now, which means we're on a roll. Uh, so in my world, there's a, there's a tele telepathic connection between people as well. So I'm thinking potentially if, if there's a shared... There's a shared mind of some sort, but it, you know, so so there's some kind of telepathic connection, and there's some kind of consciousness connection going on with the water. There's a resonance going on as well. If people have similar ideas, they tend to gravitate towards each other and spark off each other and develop things as a kind of rolling resonance, if that's the right word. That's not a technical term, I'm sure, but you get the idea. Well, I would think that what we're talking about is transmission capability at different frequencies. Yeah. And that water can probably go through the entire frequency range and carry thoughts at specific frequencies by aligning its bond angle and also its bond lengths between the oxygen and the hydrogen. And so if water wants to carry a memory, maybe it just shrinks a high oxygen hydrogen bond on, say, the left side and lengthens the one on the right side and snapshots what that looks like and correlates it with the memory it wants to retain so that when it gets to resonant frequencies, frequencies where they're driven to, if, if something is close in frequency and there's a resonant frequency, it will drift into the resonant frequency and become part of the structure. Maybe the structures themselves have resonant frequencies and it's the water that carries that frequency and transmits it to other water molecules and carries the thought along. Yeah, that sounds like it's possible. Sounds like it's possible. I'm just I'm trying to get my head around the idea of, of water molecules with different angles <laughs> at the moment because I didn't realize that happened. Uh, so that's a new thing for me. But it, that does make sense that if you can change the length of something in there and change the angle, that's the equivalent of changing a frequency. That makes total sense to me. Yeah, and there's there's two different modes of changing the length. 
there's what's called a symmetrical stretch in which both hydrogens go out or move in at the same time, sort of like a breathing pattern. And then there's the asymmetrical stretch where the left hand will be pushed, the hydrogen will be pushed more to the oxygen and on the right hand it'll stretch out a little more and then back and forth in that. And so you've got the symmetric mode and the asymmetric mode, and there's two of those asymmetric modes, but they're equal and opposite, so you couldn't tell them apart. But those three modes plus the twist of the bond angle, that's enough to allow life, memory, consciousness, and what we've been talking about. Okay, so there's, there's enough enough variation there that you can you can potentially have different communication with different atoms at different angles for want of a better way of phrasing it right and so what you would think of are clusters of water molecules now what a lot of people don't realize is that water is really really small in relation to structure built on carbon atoms the oxygen and the carbon are roughly the same size. Oxygen is uh, 16 in weight, carbon is 12 in weight. But in carbon structures, you have carbon-carbon chains. And in biology, these chains can be a couple hundred thousand to millions of carbons in a single chain, whereas water each individual water molecule is one oxygen and two hydrogens. But when you look at the human body, we're 70% water, 30% organic structure. And so you figure that if the organic structure has hundreds of thousands of carbons per molecule and the water has one oxygen per molecule, to get 70% water structure, 99 out of every 100 molecules in the body is a water molecule. 99 out of every 100? Yeah. That's a fair old amount, then, isn't it? That's a lot of water. Well, again, we're talking about order of magnitude smaller than the carbon structure itself. Right, so you can get a lot more in the same space. What's interesting is if you've ever looked at a quartz crystal... And I think a lot of people have looked at quartz crystals. Water in that easy phase would have the same type of structure as a quartz crystal, but a whole order of magnitude smaller, maybe two orders of magnitude smaller, because silica is underneath carbon in the periodic table, and so it's much bigger than the carbon structure that goes into the silica structure that makes quartz. But if water has that same shape and energy, well, that just demonstrates that any created uh, human based on silica and chips is not going to be near as efficient as humans based on water. All right, sorry, Lenny, I had, a, I had a call coming in, so I missed a little bit of that. Yeah, what I'm saying is that water can align itself with other water the same way that silica, and, uh, silica molecules, SiO2, the sand, can be turned into glass. And so I, I find water to be this amazing compound that science doesn't spend enough time looking at water or hasn't in the past. But I think right. that's going to be a key issue of this 21st century is making sure the water of the earth remains fresh water and clean enough for people to drink, which means we're going to have to change our thoughts of uh, sewage and industrial pollution and a lot of things. But water is a very versatile molecule, and I think it definitely is the seat of consciousness. Okay, that's that's a, a good place to start. Do you think that, that with, with my kind of assumption that everything's got some kind of potential for consciousness, do you think water's the base level or is it somewhere higher up in the chain? Is it is it each individual 
this is probably a daft question, but is it each individual um, electron or neutron or whatever that, that contains the consciousness, or is it the bonding between the atoms, or is it the, the atom as a whole? I think it has to be the bonding between atoms based on the explanation that I gave with modes of freedom and the bending and stretching of the water molecule. I think that the protons, neutrons, and electrons that they give us in physics are a good means of having a base to construct water molecules out of, but I'm not sure that the physics that we've learned at university level translates into the chemistry that we've learned at university level as cleanly as they would imply when they're teaching at university level. It's a good thought experiment to take every individual water molecule, assign them a human consciousness, and then from the frame of reference of that water molecule say, okay, what do I want to do today? And a water molecule that is within the body of Dennis might decide, okay, today I want to go on an adventure, so I'm going to swap out with the water that's in the bloodstream, let it take my structural capacity, and move on to another. And so water, individual water molecules can move in the body and one might be in the brain and say, okay, I don't want to be in the brain anymore. Let's go down and see what's going on in the stomach. And the one in the stomach might get flushed into the intestines and flushed out and peed into a toilet. And so that when it gets flushed down the toilet, it then takes its way back to the ocean. And 98% of all water is in the oceans of the world it's not easy for that water molecule to escape the ocean. So it might go through thousands of years stuck in the ocean before it evaporates into a cloud, gets into the rain, comes down and has another chance to align in a human or another animal or in a plant or in something that is life-giving as we tend to look at the system. Yeah, so that's kind of a, it's not reincarnation, but it's kind of a um, a process of, of uh, living in a different way, if you like. For the, if you look at it from the, the water molecules perspective, it's going back in, it's going back into a bigger pool of consciousness and then making, making its way towards being individual again. Yes, and it might be that when it's in the ocean, it doesn't have the capability of its own consciousness because it's there stuck in salt water and it's back in a form where in salt water it has to be in the envelope surrounding one of the ions, either a positive charged ion called a cation or a negative charged ion called an anion. But these waters form a hydration sphere around the ions and it gives the ions a bigger a uh, lattice of influence. And so depending on the ionic strength of the solution, the ionic strength would tell you how many ions are dissolved in the water. And the more ions that are dissolved in the water, the wa more the individual water molecules are oriented to that ion. But if you figure that an ion might contain, let's say, a thousand different water molecules in its hydration sphere, the ones that are directly attached to the ion on the inside aren't going anywhere, whereas the ones that are in the outer shell, and you think about the shells like you think of a target in archery, those outer ones can escape the influence of one ion, and then they've got get into the influence of another ion. But when they evaporate from the ocean and get into the gas phase and get taken up in the water cycle, now 
there's not really an ion to stick to. And so the water can find other water molecules and start making clusters. And eventually the cluster gets big enough that it returns to Earth in the rain. And that begins that individual water molecules adventure to get back into the ocean. Right. Okay. Now, when you're talking about that, I don't know why I'm but I'm thinking about the idea of uh, the, the idea that Leibniz came up with, with of monads. So the idea is that that every the smallest speck of of anything is a is a monad that then builds up into the actual thing. I'm not describing this very well, but you'll know what I'm talking about. It's like it's like an atom, but not quite. It's just this, it's the infinitesimally small bit of something that that in theory has a consciousness. Uh, um, mathematically, I think he did it. It's the way he did it because he, he came up with with calculus of some sort to to get to the smallest point. But the idea is that the smallest point and the largest amount uh, are linked somehow in consciousness. That's, yeah, yeah, I I tend to look at the entire function of scale as a giant Mobius strip where the very, very small and the infinitely large are actually the same. Yeah. And so uh, I think it was Nassim Harriman who created the line of size from 10 to the minus 34th, which is the Planck constant, up to 10 to the positive 89th, which is... Uh, the largest, biggest envision of the combination of the universe. And he placed humans right in the middle. Actually, it couldn't have been the 10 to the 89th. If it, anyway, humans, if the water molecule is 10 to the zero, which is one, then that's different than if the human is 10 to the zero, and if the human is 10 to the zero, the water molecule would be 10 to the minus nine. So it human would be 10 to the plus nine on the water molecule scale. 10 to the ninth is what, a billion? I'm going to take your word for that, Lenny. One with nine zeros after it? Yeah, that's um, yeah, pretty close to a billion. It's a, a very large number indeed. And it's actually not that large in relation to other numbers in the power of 10 system. But I kind of figure that 10 to the third, which is a thousand, is about the length of a scale. I mean, 10 to the third smaller than human gives us a grain of sand or a, a salt crystal. Um, right. 10 to the positive third allows us to look at the stars in the universe. Thousands, well, they're way more than thousands of miles away. They're, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm starting to lose faith in the model that we've been given of how everything works. But I've developed a model based on water consciousness that seems to work for the water and figuring out the roles of water at water scale. If they've got intelligent mind and act like humans, then water scale is a fractal of human scale, but it's 10 to the ninth away. That would be three orders of magnitude. Well, one order of magnitude away is adjacent, 50% self-similarity. Two orders of magnitude, half of that, 25% self-similarity. Three orders of magnitude, 12.5% self-similarity. So would we even notice 12.5%, roughly 10% difference? 10% similarity, not difference, a 10% similarity between water at water scale and human at human scale. So they could very easily be fractals of each other and have fractal similarity, but not 
enough similarity on a physical basis to even look the same. Right. Okay. Have you ever taken the Mendelbrot set and just watched it on a computer screen for like 10 minutes? Yep, I've done that. I've done that more than once. And you tend to see the same patterns recurring over and over, but you don't see those patterns coming up in the same order or in the same way. But right. you recognize certain forms that you say, oh, I've seen that before. It's part of the Mendelbrot set. Yeah, it's like the, the pattern pattern recognition is more important than the than the detail of it to some to some extent, maybe. Yeah, and so I think fractals work in patterns, and that at different scale, we have to have different things that that work in similar but not the same ways, so that different fractals rhyme with each other. Well, if time is a function of scale and different fractals that overlap have the same exponent of a power of 10, then uh, that would explain mathematically how you could get similarity in things of vastly different sizes. Okay, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. I remember watching a, a YouTube, actually, I, I did this in meditation as well many years ago, or, uh, before I saw it on YouTube, where I was kind of taken, taken deep into the structure of, I don't know how this even happens in, in med my meditations, but it does, uh, taken deep into the structure of an atom and then pulled right back out to to watch the earth and then out as far as to watching watching galaxies and then from there i came back in but it was like it was a very weird experience where i was just basically being being pulled around to different scales of of uh, understanding of things did it come that you saw similar patterns at different scales like you would in watching the mendelbrot set uh, it, it does on that video on YouTube. I can't remember actually seeing similar patterns. It all just felt very familiar. So I, I, I don't know whether I was, rather than seeing patterns, I was just feeling the familiarity of it. It seems... There was, there was, no, there was no jarring for it. That's what okay. I'm trying to say. There was no, when I was moving in and out of that scale, there was no jarring jarring shifts. It was all quite, quite smooth. So there was a lot of... Sim there was at least some similarity that I was holding on to as I was moving up and down the scale. There is a video called Powers of Ten that I've seen in at least two different forms on YouTube. There was an older version and a newer version, but it starts with a couple people lying in a park in the city of Chicago, and it takes you out way into galactic scale and then brings you back and takes you down to uh, inside the nucleus to the physics scale of things. And it's yeah. about a 10-minute video. It shifts by a power of 10 every 10 seconds. And if people want to get a feel for how this works, they could watch that. But I really got the impression that what they were showing us was artists' conceptions of how things should be and had no real grounding in reality at all. Right. I mean, within the reality of the range that we know it was grounded, but once you get out into galac galaxies and space, it all tends to look like itself at whatever fractal you're looking at, and you can't really tell the difference. So they get artists to create different things, but I think if we changed scale, we would find that our artists are locked into the human scale that they have their brains designed at, and that the function of the human brain isn't, as it's been explained, it's more dependent on the structure of water. Yeah, there's another kind of experiment that I did just after just after New Year, uh, which was uh, which was to try and try and see myself from the perspective of the of the 
the Milky Way galaxy, which was a tricky thing to do because by the time I'd got to a place where, where I had galactic consciousness, I didn't even understand what human was. So it was very tricky having conversations with people for that particular day. I think I offended quite a few people just by saying, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm good at doing that too. I'm good at offending people by talking about science and not even realizing that they've taken offense to my stepping outside of what they learned in the university system and creating an image that they can't accept because they've been locked into what they were taught. And I think belief in what we were taught without going and finding further example, that that gets you into a hard place because you've got no firm grounding on the intersection of beliefs. Yeah, I, I was going to mention to you actually, Lenny, I've been watching a... a, a a thing called The Portal on YouTube recently, which I think I recognized in, in what they were saying on there, I recognized at least some of the things that you've been saying, but it's in different language. It's quite academic and intellectual, and your version is, is easier to understand, I think. But they were, they were definitely talking about the three timelines, uh, Armageddon, uh, New Earth, Earth Consciousness, and something else. He was, he was, saying, it in a, he was saying it in a different way. It's a guy called Eric Weinstein. Well, I think I think you'd enjoy it. Okay, I'll jot that down in my book. Because he's talking about he's using quite intellectual language. It's all it's all very kind of academic and uh, like uh, cocktail academic cocktail party type language. But if you can get through that, it's it's the same stuff, but just spoken about in a different way. And he's he's. He's got very similar approach to the, the the university system as you do, and he's coming up with similar ideas. So it might be worth uh, at least listening to what he's got to say and maybe connecting up with it. Certainly. Drop me a link if you get the chance. But, you know, the idea of connecting physics and philosophy is it, it's not something that I came up with on my own. In fact, if you go back to Anne Rand in the 1950s in her book, Atlas Shrugged, physics and philosophy were the two parts of the university system that were used to train John Galt, Francisco de Anaconia, and Ragnar Daniskold, the three protagonists of the people who stopped the way the planet works. So if she was able to identify that physics and philosophy fundamentally could be incorrectly perceived, united, and then restructured as something differently correct, now we have places to go that are outside the current lock that we have on understanding of the system. And uh, I don't know. I think that what we're being told as a bulk community of humans and the reality of how things exist are very, very different. Okay, I'm, I'm quite happy to speculate. I don't really have any strong opinions on these things, but I'm, I'm interested in, in everything you've got to say, and I'm, I'm interested in speculating a little bit. So that's, that's what I do in my in my philosophy groups in Newcastle is we just we just let things roll until we come to a, a ridiculous conclusion somewhere down the line. Well, I like to speculate on the physics because I really was well grounded in the world of physics when I was in school. It was one of those things that made sense to me so I could go deep into a physics course and get to the point where I could ask the teacher a question and nobody in the class, including the teacher, knew where I was coming from because I was way deeper. But the mathematics of physics made sense to me and I never had problems with mathematics because, I, I don't know, maybe it was from reading Asimov as a child and having a person who could explain the concepts of physics 
chemistry and biology in terms and then take them into a world of science fiction where the fiction was an account of how things worked in the Asimov created real world, but the Asimov created real world was a function of what Asimov was told to teach. So you get science fiction presented as something that's completely fantasy and you're not supposed to believe anything written in the fiction. On the other hand, the fiction is more true than reality because it can explain by taking what ifs and allowing you to work them through, whereas the reality is very black and white. It works that way or it doesn't work that way. In some of my work recently, recently over the past 10 to 15 years, I've been delving into the physics of a gentleman named Walter Russell. And Walter Russell had a spiral-based periodic table very, very different than the Mendeleev table that were taught as the basis of chemistry. Just because they're different doesn't mean that one is correct and the other is incorrect. It's just a different model for looking at the same thing from different perspectives. But I really was taken by a guy named Richard Feynman and his physics model, which is called QED, quantum electrodynamics. And when it got to the point where working from QED up and working from chemistry down, I reached a point where there wasn't alignment between physics and chemistry. And for the life of me, I've been struggling with the question of quarks and whether there's a chemistry of quarks, because coming from the physics perspective, I don't see it at all. But there kind of has to be for it to be one big continuity on fractal scale as above, so below. And so if quarks really do exist, there has to be a way to get to the chemistry of quarks. Now, right. what's interesting is that chemistry is based on duality, positive and negative. But quarks, there's a cluster of three, two ups and a down two charms and a strange, two tops and a bottom, or one top and two bottoms. I'm not quite sure how it is, but now you see in some of the real woo-woo places, they're talking about toplet bombs. And for there to be something called a toplet bond implies that there's got to be a chemistry of quarks. But I can't get there through either Mendeleev or Walter Russell's periodic table. Right, so there's got to be a different way of approaching that will get there, but we don't know what it is yet. Yeah, and so I think there's a lot of room for creativity within the human mind with the assumption that the mind itself is more like an organizing place and that it's the water that's conscious and that Water somehow feeds back into the mind system, which operates the body from water scale. But when you look at water scale and realize it's it's three scales away from human scale, it doesn't have to work anything like human scale works, but it has to be a fractal of human scale. And I think maybe we can redefine a fractal as being something that has the same configuration. A fractal scale is like a musical scale. And we know that musical scales, you've got the middle C and you go through the same set of characters. And no matter what scale you're working with in music, the order of the scale is the same. Similarly, when you're looking at light, the order of color in the rainbow is the same. And so light and sound both follow the same fractal patterns, and that should be enough to give us some clues on how things really work differently than what we're taught currently by the university system. 
Right, my head's gone off in a completely different place now, and I'm wondering whether it's possible to channel the consciousness of a water molecule. Because if there's consciousness there and there's telepathic connection, I don't know whether it's possible or not, but um, I was just speculating in my head because I've channeled quite a few different things that that most people wouldn't imagine were possible. So I'm, I'm imagining that it might be possible to channel the consciousness of a specific water molecule at this point. I think it would be. And what's more, I think if you channel the consciousness of an individual water molecule, you might find that it leads to a very similar picture as channeling the consciousness of another human. That maybe water molecules are humans, but they work in a time frame of femtoseconds or 10 to the minus 12th and that the consciousness of what they realize, an 80-year period for an individual water molecule takes a femtosecond of time in the reality of a human. And so that actually translates out into another order of magnitude, but it would be adjacent to the size of the water molecule. So it's a 50% self-similarity requirement there, but no self-similarity requirement to this human scale because 10% is the threshold of where you can draw the line. If it's not at least 10% similar, there's no similarity there. And even at 10%, that's a real stretch. Yeah, I'm, I'm think, thinking about it. That you'd have to invent a completely new language to be able to do that. I think it might be, it might be a lifetime's work to be able to do that. But a number of people have invented new languages, though. And so, I don't know. I once thought about learning Esperanto. Right. And I didn't, chose not to because I was afraid that if I started thinking in a whole nother language, I'd lose the little touch with reality that I have at this point. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that my one day of, of being the consciousness of a galaxy was, was probably enough. Um, I don't really want to spend the rest of my life channeling water molecules because that would just be completely... It would just isolate me too much. <laughs> I'm already isolated. I don't want to do any more. What if a water molecule and a galaxy both had the same level of consciousness? That's possible. It, it depends how you define consciousness. If you, but I suppose it, it's at, at the scale that we're talking about. There's, if we're talking about surface area or something like that, in terms of kind of recording information. Is it kind of a similar kind of surface area at the different scales? I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't even think it involves surface area at all. I think it's a function of frequency. Yeah. And so what you might be looking at is uh, mathematical size constraints that follow something like the Fibonacci sequence. And so if you take a jump from, say, 89 to 144 that could take the same amount of time as a jump from two to three right but the growth of 89 to 144 is much much faster than the growth of two to three now if you start taking it up into the millions and billions because what, what's the current population of the Earth? They tell us it's somewhere about 7 billion. Yeah, it's roughly that. And so if we've got that many people on Earth that are all connected in a resonant mindset with each other, but all have their individual ways of thinking, well, that's not even close to the amount of grains of sand on a beach or the number of water molecules in an ocean. So there's definitely something to the fractal reality of how things work on different scales that we're not getting from this human scale unless maybe this human scale 
is a variable and not a constant and that at any given day when we wake up from our sleep, we could be in a narrative that stays the same, but on a world that's of a different scale than the one we went to bed in last night. Right. I, I seem to be able to shift. Well, I certainly managed to shift into, into gal galactic consciousness. I couldn't do the universal scale. That, that blew my brain a bit. But the, the, the galaxy thing was possible for me. So I know that I can move up and down in, to different perspectives in terms of consciousness just because I've done it. So I'm, I'm guessing that for, what, for whatever reason... Uh, I've never tried going downwards. I've never tried to try to go smaller, but I can certainly go bigger, and I don't have too much trouble with that. I've done some thought experiments going smaller, to where I went into the top six inches of the earth, the topsoil, so to speak, and I got myself into a mindset of a microbe operating on that scale and started looking at the interactions between fungi and tree roots and worms and other little bugs, add in tardigrades and other small things. And there's no question in my mind that I could create a universe at that scale that could be duplicated in many different fractal patterns and never quite be the same. The roles of each of the biological components in that topsoil dirt made it so that there was definitely a contrast from one environment to another. But if I was underneath near the roots of a tree, it was vastly different than if I was out in a desert where there was no real organic life except for maybe cactuses and uh, certain types of well-armored critters. Yeah, and it's, of course, it's for, for each, for each, for each um, organism in that, in that topsoil is a different perspective. So the, 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 the worms and the, 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 the worm-like creatures are going to have one perspective. The, uh, the microbes are going to have a different perspective on the same environment. So you've, got a, you've got, still got a thousand different perspectives, a thousand different um, consciousnesses, for want of a better phrase, of, the, of that environment. Absolutely, but they also all contain the consciousness of water. And so at that level, if the water is directing everything, there could be an overall plan from the water on how things have to get done. And maybe even at that level, exchange of water is the currency that people use. And so whereas we use money on human scale, maybe fungus and tree roots and micro uh, fauna and microflora exchange water and energy as their value set and the water can absorb or let loose different energy by changing its bond angle and bond lengths right my mind's just been blown <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's right. been a pleasure as always I think we probably ought to start wrapping up because we've got about a minute or maybe two minutes is there anything you want to uh, tell people about before we before we wrap up? If you want to find me, you can find me on minds.com as the Mad Doctor Time. Just run the words together and it should be able to find me. And I'd like to thank the chat room and the listeners at Revolution Radio. It's really worthwhile for listeners to support the radio because that's the only support that the station gets is from listeners. Absolutely, absolutely. There's a donation button and there's also a Patreon button at revolution.radio for people who want to go over there and just, just throw $5 a month in if you've got it. If you don't have it, do what you can when you can. Uh, but it's been an absolute pleasure, Lenny, as always. Um, this has got to be continued at another time. Uh, I'll catch up with it um, during the week sometime, but that's the music there. Thanks, Lenny.